Welcome back to our Bible study as we are in the home stretch of our in the book of John. Last week, we covered the death and burial of Jesus. And this week, we'll be looking at the resurrection and the empty tomb. But now let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the only one who can bring good news from the grave. Help us today to stand at the foot of the empty tomb and gaze in. Take away our daily distractions and help us to stay focused in the full meaning and depth of the empty tomb. Allow the truth of the empty tomb to remove any fears that we might have in dealing with our own inevitable physical death. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going today, I am not sure if you guys heard the news with all the attention given to the eclipse for the last several weeks, but one of the most famous atheists at age 83 is having an identity crisis. Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, came out last week and said he identified as a cultural Christian. He loves the church, Christmas, and living in a society that lives by Christian ethics, but he doesn't believe. Remember, th this is the man who wrote the infamous book, The God Delusion, where he said there is no supernatural creator and religion and faith are a delusion. I watched the interview because I could hardly believe it. So I wanted to hear it for myself. What, <clears throat> what I saw was a tortured man. He talked about how much he loved the outward trappings of the church and the ethics that came from Christianity. But he dogmatically still denied belief in any of it. And I'm not sure how he's able to reconcile those two thoughts. He doesn't believe in the faith that manifests virtue and ethics that he loves. After watching the interview, I was sad because Dawkins is missing the best part of Christianity, and that is to have a close relationship with Jesus, that we identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. To know the love of God, the peace of God, and have the totality of the Trinity dwelling inside of, inside of us? The Apostle Paul in Galatians puts it this way. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's identity changed so much that he essentially said it wasn't him who lived, but it was Christ living inside of him. <clears throat> but this week, because the disciples were still trying to process the crucifixion, death, and burial, they were faced with their own identity crisis. So our lesson today is divided into two divisions. Division one is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, reactions to the empty tomb. And our second division is John chapter 20, verses 11 through 31, reactions to the resurrection. So we get started in our first division, reactions to the empty tomb. Please turn to verse 1. Before we dive into scripture, a modern day theologian said, if the gospel of John were an ordinary biography, there would be no chapter 20. If you're a reader of biographies, then you know firsthand that biographies typically end with the death and burial of the subject. But John was writing about the Son of God. And so the beauty of the gospel narrative continues. Now, <clears throat> in this section of scripture, scripture, John only focuses on three followers of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John. Now, from the other gospels, we know there were more, but John assumes that the readers are familiar with the synoptic gospels. And so that is where we will also focus today. Now, let's start reading at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene 
went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Mary says, They've taken the Lord. Who is the they? Mary's initial conclusion of the empty tomb was wrong. She assumed potentially grave robbers had taken the body. We don't hear much about grave robbing in the 21st century, but back then it was a real issue. And Mary's first thought was someone had taken the body. She wasn't thinking about the resurrection yet. Now Mary ran back to the disciples where she proclaims the body is gone and we don't know where the body is at. So at this point, the reality of Jesus' resurrection had not sunk in yet for her. She was still focusing on the physical body and not the spiritual significance of the empty tomb. Now let's turn back to the passage and start reading in verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, Mary's shocking news got Peter and John making the graveyard dash, where John outruns Peter. But in Peter's defense, he is the first one to cross the finishing line and enter the tomb. Now, this is conjecture, but the disciples had Saturday to discuss and process through everything that had happened the day before. But it doesn't appear that they had any discussions or searching the scripture regarding the resurrection because the reality of the empty tomb seems so shocking to them. Let's turn back to scripture and read starting in verse five. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside and saw and believed. Bible scholars often go deeper by analyzing the verbal phrases in the Greek. Often the Greek language would, will utilize several words and subtle different meanings, whereas English might only use one word. This passage is a good example. For instance, this section we see the words liked, saw, and saw used when John and Peter were viewing the empty tomb. The ESV translation uses the word saw in all three cases. But if we were reading the passage in Greek, we would see three different Greek words used. If you turn your attention to the screen, you will see the three Greek words that are used with a brief definition. When John first looks into the tomb and sees the strips of linen, the word blepo is used, which simply means to notice, which is the same Greek word blippo when Mary saw that the stone had been rolled away. Mary saw the stone was rolled away, but didn't draw any conclusions. Just like John, who saw the strips of linen, but didn't draw any conclusions. When Peter sees the linen strips, the word theorio is used This is where we get the word theater from. It means to study closely, but he didn't come to a suitable conclusion. It hadn't clicked yet in his mind. Now, when John enters the tomb, the word idan is used, which means to see with comprehension or understanding. Based on the evidence in the tomb, John got it. It clicked. He was tracking, and that is why the Greek word idan was used. So what is it about the linen left behind that caused John to understand that Jesus had risen from the grave? When Joseph and Nicodemus buried Jesus, they soaked the linen strips 
and 75 pounds of olives and spices. Then they wrapped his body in this gooey mixture. And when the linen dried, it would have formed a semi-hard cocoon. So John and Peter didn't see a grave ransacked by grave robbers, but they saw an orderly grave instead. Another way to picture it, the cocoon was undisturbed because Jesus just passed through the grave clothes. Essentially, the cocoon was left intact and was not disturbed. The cocoon would have retained its shape, but just a little compressed from the absence of the body and the weight of the olives and spices. Moving on, thankfully, John explains why, in verse 9, why the disciples were slow in understanding the full meaning of the empty tomb. Let's read verse 9. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had, had to rise from the dead. Up on the screen, I've listed the Old Testament prophecies that, that alludes to Jesus' resurrection. Potentially, dealing with post-traumatic stress of seeing Jesus brutalized on the cross was blurring their memory recall of the Old Testament passages and connecting the dots with the empty tomb. As we normally do, we want to take a few minutes and focus on the BSF doctrinal focus this week, which is the resurrection. Like always, you'll find more information about the this doctrine in your BSF provided notes. Also, in the notes this week, there's a highlighted section on the evidence for the resurrection. It's really good. In fact, it's so good, some of you might want to cut it out and put it right in your Bible for future reference. Now let's discuss the resurrection. The empty tomb proclaims the truth and glory of Jesus' resurrection. Hundreds of people were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection between his death and ascension, which was validated by the empty tomb. The resurrected Lord personally testifies to his loved ones of his victory over death. As believers, we experience Jesus' resurrected life today and anticipate his glory, glorious presence for all eternity. As we encounter the resurrected Christ, his presence empowers us to overcome our grief, fears, questions, and doubts. Which leads us to our first principle, which is the empty tomb confirms Jesus' resurrection. The empty tomb confirms Jesus' resurrection. Often we run into people who see Christianity as one of the many world religions or mythologies, ancient stories with a moral message. While that is true of many of the world religions, it isn't true for biblical Christianity. The resurrection uniquely separates Christianity from all other religions. The cross is the most recognized symbol for Christianity, but it's the empty tomb that validates that Jesus is who he said he was. The two angels didn't roll away the stone to allow Jesus to get out, but they rolled away the stone so his followers could witness the empty tomb and believe. John went to significant efforts to describe who Jesus is and what he has done. John wanted us to know that Jesus is the one who came from heaven to reveal heaven to us. He came from the Father so we can know the Father through him and have confidence that Jesus defeated Satan, sin, and death. And that proof is validated by the empty tomb. So let me ask you, how does the truth of the empty tomb impact your perspective of your own physical death? How does the truth of the empty tomb impact your perspective of your own physical death? As we start our second division, reactions to the resurrection, please turn to verse 11. I might have mentioned this before, but John is writing his gospel account as an old man. This is his last book to write. The thing about age is it forces you to look back on life from a perspective of standing on the threshold of death. From this vantage point, John in this passage 
is making an earnest plea to all those who will come after him to believe. And by believing, you may have life in his name. In chapter 20, John presents four encounters with the risen Christ. And in each case, he highlights a crisis in belief. We've already covered Peter and John, but next we'll discuss Mary and then the disciples, and we will finish with Thomas. Now, Mary had returned to the tomb when Peter and John had their graveyard dash, but now it appears that Peter and John returned back to where the other disciples were at. But Mary lingered behind at the tomb as she continued to grieve for the Lord. Now let's turn back to scripture. Let's start reading in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been, at one the head and the other at the foot. Now the focus of this passage is Mary overcoming her grief to believe in Jesus' resurrection. But if you read this passage too quickly, you might miss an amazing image of the angels in the empty tomb. Remember, <clears throat> John's account is brief. So when he gives details, it isn't to round out the narrative. It's a speed bump for us to slow down and ponder the significance. John was the only gospel writer to mention the two angels sitting, one at the head and the one at the feet where Jesus' body had laid. Why did John include this detail? Well, John wants us to visualize an amazing connection between the empty tomb of Jesus and the Ark of the Covenant from the Old Testament. If you look at the screen, the photo is a typical stone burial ledge in a traditional Jewish tomb. In fact, if you go to the garden tomb in Jerusalem today, you will find this is the burial ledge in the tomb. But now, picture one angel at the head and one angel at the foot. Remember, through Jesus' death, we've been justified and have found mercy with God. It is by Jesus' blood that we're able to receive mercy from God. Now, <clears throat> hold on to that mental picture as I flip to the next slide. Now, on the screen is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Notice the two angels on the lid. One is at one end, while the other is on the other end. Now, the lid of the Ark had a special name, and it was called the Mercy Seat. So how the angels, so how the angels are on both sides of the mercy seat, the burial ledge where they laid Jesus' bloody body is the mercy seat. It's because of his blood we have been forgiven. Remember on the day of atonement, the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat for the atonement of Israel's sins. So the two angels sitting on the burial ledge helps Mary and us to see the imagery and the significance of the Ark of the Covenant and its fulfillment through Jesus. As we turn back to Mary, Mary is still grieving outside of the tomb. Let's pick it back up, starting in verse 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. It's concerning that Mary's grief was preventing her from recognizing Jesus. In fact, she mistakes his identity and thinks he is the gardener. And at this point, Mary is still searching for a corpse, and her eyes are filled with tears for her Lord, which illustrates a point. Deep sorrow can cloud our vision and judgment. Unfortunately, severe grief 
can take us down a road where we become blind to the presence of Jesus in our lives. But like in Mary's case, Jesus is right next to us, asking us about our grief. Turning back to Mary, we see the power of Jesus' spoken word. When he spoke her name, she immediately realizes, realized it was him, which had the effect of snapping her out of her grief as she boldly proclaimed, Rabboni. Let's turn back to scripture as we read verse 17. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Verse 17 is a little challenging, not just for us, but also for Bible scholars. The important thing to grab onto is Mary saw the risen Lord. He is alive, and he was continuing to accomplish the Father's plan. There, there is no relationship closer than the family relationship. Because God is holy, a holy God cannot have a close relationship with sinful man. We lost that close intimacy with God. Before the cross, Jesus called his disciples servants and friends, but he never called them brothers. But now, he calls them brothers and uses the phrase, my father and your father to my God and your God. Jesus expresses himself in this very intimate way, which was the audio version of the reality of the torn veil in the temple. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, and he restored the relationship between God and man. The veil had been torn. Now that Mary is over her grief and crisis in her faith, Jesus turns to his group of disciples that are gripped in fear, hiding behind closed doors. In their defense, the disciples had experienced a rough three days. They narrowly escaped the arrest of the Garden of Gethsemane. Their Lord had been crucified by their own religious leaders. Fear was preventing the disciples from moving forward as they were probably wondering what was going to happen next and what should be their next move. Let's turn back to the passage. Let's we'll start reading in verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus came and revealed himself to the rest of the disciples because they were paralyzed by fear and were still struggling with their unbelief of the resurrection. The Prince of Peace gives them peace that he was alive and risen as he revealed the evidence of the nail holes and spear hole in his side. Jesus' appearance, coupled with the evidence, is what the disciples needed to turn their paralyzing fear into overflowing joy, which is a good lesson for us. When the world tries to steal our joy and create a situation of fear, we need to remember, Jesus gives us peace that surpasses all understanding. Now that, the, now that the disciples <clears throat> have overcome their fear with Jesus' encouragement and peace, Jesus is now going to commission his disciples to continue the advancement of the kingdom. Let's read starting in verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As Jesus was sent from the Father, Jesus is now sending his disciples where they would need the power of the Holy Spirit to carry forward God's mission, which we see in verse 22, as Jesus breathes on the disciples as they receive the Holy Spirit. By Jesus breathing new life into them reminds us of Genesis 2-7, where after God had formed Adam, 
He then breathed the breath of life into Adam. This is a challenging section of scripture for us. It brings up the question, how does the disciples receiving of the Holy Spirit in this chapter compare to when they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? First of all, in John, the disciples were struggling with unbelief and not fully understanding the significance of the resurrection. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples potentially for the same reason that he showed them his hands and side so that they would come to a fuller, deeper understanding of the resurrection. This was an intimate moment with Jesus and his disciples with no one else around. But the disciples in Acts chapter 2 were empowered and emboldened by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the message of Jesus and his work to a large crowd of people without Jesus present with them. Bible scholars put it this way. This is a partial fulfillment, a foretaste of the anticipated fuller enablement and power that would come in Acts chapter 2. Now, let's cover the last verse of the commissioning of the disciples. Let's read verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Through our study this year, I've mentioned that all scripture is equally true, but not all scripture is equally clear. And this verse is a good example of that principle. Also, with challenging verses, it's important to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Meaning, by reconciling this verse with other verses in the Bible, it helps the reader to develop a correct meaning behind the verse. For instance, we know throughout the Bible, only God can forgive sins. No doubt the apostles were a special group of men handpicked by Jesus, and they would be responsible for forging the early church through their God-ordained apostolic authority. But is this verse telling us that Jesus gave the apostles special authority to forgive or not to forgive sin? Well, John also wrote 1 John 1, 9, which clearly demonstrates the pathway for forgiveness of sins is through personal confession to God. This is covered in the notes, but just quickly let me say, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, gave the disciples and has given us the authority to tell the world the bad news, that their sins have eternally separated them from God. And the disciples and us have the authority to proclaim the good news, that their sins are forgiven because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But if they reject Jesus as their Savior, in a loving way, we have the authority to tell them that their sins are unforgiven, and they stand condemned before God in their sins. Now that Jesus had restored the disciples' faith and commissioned them, he had one more straying disciple that needed help in overcoming his doubts and unbelief. I won't be able to cover everything in the chapter like I want to, but read the BSF notes. They do a great job of covering the passage. But now let's turn to verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. A week later, the disciples are back in the locked room. But this time, Thomas is present. The disciples have been witnessing to Thomas about Jesus, but Thomas gives an ultimatum and more or less says he won't believe unless he touches the holes. And in Jesus' loving grace, he meets Thomas where he is at in his unbelief. 
Jesus's actions allowed Thomas to move past his doubts and unbelief. And from this, we see Jesus turned a doubter into the person who gave the strongest proclamation, my Lord, my God. And still today, Jesus meets us in our doubts through his word, answered prayer, and circumstances in our lives so that we would stop doubting and believe. Which brings us to our second principle. The resurrection will test our faith. The resurrection will test our faith. In this passage, we have seen several different ways people responded to Jesus' resurrection. And initially, their faith in Jesus was put to the test. Some believed with indirect evidence, while some believed with direct evidence, while others, included all future believers, believe without indirect or direct evidence. They believe the promises of God in the scriptures, Jesus' predictions, and the eyewitness accounts of others. You know, Jesus provided miracles and signs to help people come to faith, but Jesus also was selective who he provided evidence to. For instance, the risen Lord revealed himself to his followers and those who were close to him. He didn't reveal himself to the Jewish priest or to Pilate or Herod after the resurrection. He offered tangible evidence to willing hearts in order to increase their confidence and trust in God. Faith and evidence are not unrelated in the spiritual life. However, a start the starting point is crucial. It must be trust in God first, and then evidence is helpful. Evidence apart from belief is meaningless. And that is why witnessing, it's important to have the person understand they are a sinner in need of a savior. And Jesus is the only one qualified who died, was buried, and rose to life on their behalf. So let me ask you, what doubts might be hindering your call to share the gospel? What doubts might be hindering your call to share the gospel? As we wrap up today, the big idea for this chapter is Jesus' resurrection. Belief in the living Jesus Christ is a crucial matter with a profound impact on the world. Limiting yourself to belief in a historical Jesus only or a Jesus who was not raised from the dead will lead to disastrous consequences. To deny the resurrection is to deny scripture. To deny scripture is to deny the existence of God. To deny God is to deny the reality, a truth, and meaning. This type of thinking leads to a meaningless life while living in a meaningless universe and a lost identity. But if you identify with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, then you have purpose and meaning in this life. And so does everyone else around you because you see others as God's creation because you find your identity in Christ. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for the empty tomb. We're thankful for all your saints who have come before us to write down their eyewitness accounts. Although some might have struggled with doubts, in the end, you replace their doubts and fears with joy and peace. Help us to recognize the peace that we so freely have that the world doesn't understand. Allow the truth of the empty tomb give us the confidence we need to be strong witnesses to others who need to hear your gospel. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.